Well, actually, we, there we go. Thank you, sir. And uh, we start with birthdays today. And, uh, and speaking of today, Kyle Berghold has a birthday today. We congratulate him. Kyle's out in Kansas City. Ken Partial tomorrow. Uh, and then Jeff Bennett and Phoebe Vandiver. Phoebe was in our early service uh, on Thursday. And then Carol Bennett uh, next Saturday. And so you notice Jeff and Carol, husband and wife, have the birthdays the same week. So it's going to be busy around their house. Uh, Harv and Joe, you will need to kind of take care of things for them. But uh, anyway, we are glad to have you guys back. Key West. Well, if you're going to go somewhere, you might as well go somewhere nice and warm. Okay. Well, I'm glad they are and hope they get to celebrate their birthdays together. Maybe they can get a Cuban to help them blow out their candles. But anyway, uh, we're glad you guys are here. We congratulated you last week on your anniversary. Sorry you weren't here to hear it, but we certainly convey those congratulations. Glad you're here. And we have another we need to say congratulations to. Oops, sorry. Let me turn this on. And that is Tim and Debbie Hanrahan. Debbie's back here this morning, and they were blessed last weekend with a new grandbaby, Merrick Wayne Campbell. This is Laura's second child. I believe she has a little girl, and, uh, and so this is her second child, and uh, forgive me, third or fourth grandchild? Fourth grandchild. So uh, certainly, Debbie, congratulations to you and to Tim. I shared with folks in the early service, I think I've shared with you before, my brother happens to be a great-grandpa because his grandson had a baby here a year or so ago. And somebody asked me, well, are you a great grandpa? And I tell them, I've always been a great grandpa, man. I've worked at it. And uh, so anyway, um, being a grandparent's a wonderful thing. I've always said it's the reward God gives you for not killing teenagers when you're tempted. So uh, you know, <laughs> some of us understand what that's all about. But indeed, our congratulations, Debbie. All right. And then I have some prayer concerns to share with you. And, and uh, so let me bring you up to date on those. Uh, Karen Barrett sent me a message just last night. Karen, thank you for reaching out to me, just letting me know how grateful she is for the prayers of the church family, and she continues to recover uh, from surgery she had a couple of weeks ago. Leora Chapman is in the hospital now and receiving um, acute rehab therapy for a broken leg as well as some wounds on her leg that she's had trouble with for several weeks. So be in prayer for Leora. Bob was in our early service this morning. Linda Moore continues to recover at home and uh, ask your prayers for Ed and Linda. As she recovers, uh, she had heart valve replacement last week. Jim O'Shea was in our early service this morning. Um, Jim is scheduled for bladder surgery to remove a malignant tumor, and that'll come sometime down the road. They haven't scheduled that yet, but he and Dixie certainly in need of our prayers. And last of all, Jerry Smith, and Jerry was put in the hospital this week with congestive heart failure. Uh, she has some concerns for her kidneys and some other things, so certainly be in prayer for Jerry uh, as she's there. And I, just to let you know, both she and Leora are at Mercy South, so if you wanted to give them a call and just let them know of your thoughts and prayers, please do. And others of you have requested prayer, and certainly I acknowledge that, and, and uh, there are others that perhaps you have on your heart. Uh, that you want to pray for and let me give you an opportunity to do that as we exercise the privilege that God gives us to call on him in prayer father we come to you just now and Lord it is in gratitude for the privilege of prayer but also feeling a responsibility for the ministry of intercession so Lord we bear this burden to you and we lay it before you in confidence and in Jesus name that you will meet their needs according to your loving kindness according to your mercy according to your healing power we pray for each one that according to your will they might genuinely be comforted and blessed and we ask Lord that you would help us as a church family that we might remain faithful to you in our intercessory prayer and faithful to them in showing them our love and concern now guide us as we continue to worship you. We do so in faith and in Jesus' name, amen. All right, one other thing before we begin the service this morning. have my former neighbor and dear friend Wanda with us this morning. Wanda, I'm honored to have you here today. Welcome, dear friend. And uh, uh, Rick and Mary, glad to have you back. But uh, I think uh, one of your uh, church members or, or a sister in Christ, 
Louise Summers was in our early service this morning. I believe you know Louise, and uh, she was here, as was Georgia. We're glad to have them back. These folks come to us from what was called the Rock Ministry. It formerly was uh, Melville Baptist Church, and unfortunately that church had closed its doors. We are very grateful to be able to reach out to you in Christian fellowship, and you're always welcome to worship with us, and certainly welcome to, uh, to the rest of you as well. We are glad you are here. And those of you who are watching online, as I encouraged earlier, I hope you will plan to uh, join us as we celebrate this communion this morning. And I want to take just a few moments to celebrate relationship. Now, we as Baptists traditionally have referred to this as the Lord's Supper, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. But I want, to, want you to focus on the word communion this morning. And we, like I said, we can call it alternatively communion or the Lord's Supper. Now, when I was a young boy growing up over in Alton, it, was, it just seemed logical to call it the Lord's Supper because it was always served at night. And in fact, in the church I grew up in, it was only served on Wednesday night because that was the time when you would have the fewest visitors. It was something called close communion. And back then, Baptists believed that if you weren't actually a member of that church, you weren't supposed to receive the Lord's Supper. But I thank God that through the years, Baptists got smarter, read God's word and found out, you know what? I don't have the authority to invite or exclude anyone from the Lord's table. And we don't do that here at First Baptist Church of Oakville. So to our friends who are with us, you are welcome to participate in this communion with us. We are glad you are here to share it because it is the Lord's table. And if you come to the Lord's table in faith and in Jesus' name, you are welcome at that table, not by us, but by God himself. Now, one of the things I want to make clear to you is, uh, again, um, it seems ironic that we would call it the Lord's Supper when we do it on Sunday morning. I, Ernie, that always seemed a little bit illogical to me. And I really, there's nothing wrong with the word communion. The honest truth is, 100 years or so ago, the word communion fell out of favor with us as Baptists because that's what other churches used. And so we had to come up with something different, okay? Communion is a very good word, and it's a very appropriate word, especially when you think about relationship, because it's not about religion. It's about relationship. So what's the difference? Religion is about performing for God. Now think about this just a moment. Some folks are very religious. Have you ever been around someone that was very religious but wasn't really very Christian? Uh, Brenda and I, years ago, uh, had gone to Boston Market over by South County Church to have lunch on Sunday. And there was ahead of us another couple. He was nicely dressed, and so was she. So I kind of guessed that, you know, they had been to church somewhere. Anyway, as they stood there and placed their order in front of this really sweet-looking high school young lady who was working the cash register, all of a sudden he became upset and berated her. She had made a mistake. She had not given them credit on a coupon that he had given her, da-da-da-da-da. Anyway, he just went on and on about the indignity of her inefficiency to the point that she actually began crying. And, but she went ahead and completed their order, gave it to them. They went and sat down. As I walked up to the counter, I apologized to her, and I said, "Hun, don't let that spoil your day. You're doing a great job. I pre we went on and ordered. I even told her a little joke and, you know, kind of helped her laugh through the tears a little bit. Anyway, it was all good. We went and sat down and across from us was this other couple and they bowed their heads and prayed before they ate their meal after they treated that young lady so poorly. I was hoping they were praying to Baal. I really was because I was embarrassed for them if they were Christian. They were being very religious they had forgotten that it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Relationship is about sharing with God. Sharing with God in worship, sharing with God in praise, sharing with God in giving, sharing with God in praying, sharing with God in reading your Bible, just sharing with God, just an intimacy with God, a sense of God's presence in this place, a sense of God's presence where you are. That's not religious, that's relational. And so the word communion is very appropriate to what I would ask you to do today because we're going to talk about our relationship first with God, 
but also our relationship with Christ. The elements of this communion symbolize that relationship. But we also at some point need to acknowledge we have a relationship with each other and finally with the world that God has put us in. Now, think about this for a moment. Relationship is essential to our faith, okay? You ever heard someone say, well, I don't have to go to church to be religious. Well, no, you don't have to go to church to be religious. In fact, you can be religious just about anywhere if it's just about performance. But for relationship, you need to be where, in a place where God, and I believe God's people, are gathering together, wherever that may be. And so our relationship with God is essential to our faith in at least three ways that come to my mind. And the first is it validates our salvation. Paul said over in Romans, you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And of course, Paul goes on to say, joint heirs with Christ. And so the point is, it's relationship. It's family that Paul says we are a part of God's family, our relationship with him. But it also, when you think about it, explains heaven and hell. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples in the upper room over in John 14? I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Friend, if you want a definition of heaven, you can't get one any better than that last phrase. That where I am, there you may be also. Why would Jesus want his disciples? Why would Jesus want us to be with him for eternity? Why would Jesus die on the cross, experience the agony and the suffering of that death because of relationship? See, when a person dies and goes to heaven, they go to be where Jesus is. Someone asked me one time, where is heaven? And that's how I answered them, because it's the best answer I could think of. Wherever Jesus is, that is heaven. And so he said that to his disciples. He says that to us as well. And so our relationship with God explains heaven. You say, but wait a minute, how does it explain hell? The best definition of hell I've ever heard, it is the extreme absence of the presence of God. Now, think about that for just a moment. The extreme absence of the presence of God. That's hell. And so uh, it explains what heaven and hell really are. And then finally, certainly it empowers our prayer life. Our intercessory prayer a while ago would have been fruitless if God did not hear our prayers. John says the miracle of prayer is not that God answers us, it's that God listens to us in the first place. And so... Jesus taught us to pray in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. Have you ever tried to influence pedal? You know what that is? Call somebody in a business or you call a doctor or you call a, a policeman or, you know. And <laughs> my brother's good about this. Whenever he gets pulled over for speeding, he always asks him, now, do you know this cop or this cop or that, you know, and, and he tries to let him know of anybody he knows trying to seek relationship. Okay, you understand that? Uh, and, and so uh, that's, that's a kind of influence peddling. If I call somebody or, or if I'm getting ready to buy a car, I might call somebody. Do you know any car salesman? Uh, you know, so when I go talk to him, I can say, hey, do you know so-and-so? Yeah, I know so-and-so. Well, I know him too. Jesus says, when you pray, pray, Father. See, I have never had to pray. God, this is John Hessel. Remember me? I, I'm the one that preaches down at Oakville, and I live over on Boardwalk Place. And, and God, you know Jerry Smith? Well, Jerry's a friend of mine. Or, or do you know Ed Manus? Ed's our chairman of deacons. Do you remember who I am? Can you imagine how frustrating and how disappointing it would be if I call God and God says, I'm not sure who you are. Jesus said, when you pray to God, all you need to say is Father, because you're his child. And it's our relationship with God that makes that true. And so when we think about it, communion symbolizes our relationship with God's Son, 
Jesus Christ because the two elements that we take, the unleavened bread and the juice, those two elements together are to remind us of the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a couple of things to share here, and I'd encourage you online if you would get just something that you could use for those symbols. It does not have to be these symbols, and I want to explain why. Some people believe that when we take communion together, that somehow these elements become different. The word for that is transubstantiation. That's a big word, but what it literally means is that they become something else. No, they don't. This is just matzo bread and grape juice. I told the early service about it. When I was at South County Church, the job there was that the, the uh, vice chairman of the deacons always prepared the elements of communion. And one year, a man named Dave Percival was our vice chairman. And Dave went to the grocery store to get grape juice, and they were all out of Welch's grape juice. So he got cran apple. But it was on sale, so he got two bottles of it. And he brought it back, and so the next Sunday we had the Lord's Supper, and when everybody took a drink of the cup, expecting it to taste like Welch's grape juice, they got this real tart introduction to Cran Apple. You know, we almost had to whistle the doxology when we were done. Anyway, the point is, Dave could have come down front and set a Bible on fire, and some of our folks would not have been any more upset. They thought, that is sacrilegious to not use Welch's grape juice, Okay. Folks, please understand, we get as close to imitating what Jesus did with his disciples as we can. They had wine, we use grape juice. They had unleavened bread, we use unleavened matzo crackers. They are only symbols. They do not become anything more than symbols. And so what you may have available if you're watching online can be just as real as a symbol as what we have here. The most important part is not the symbol. The most important part is the reality that the symbol is pointing to. And if this helps you to embrace that reality in your faith in Jesus Christ, then that's all that you require. And I do hope that you will feel at liberty to celebrate communion with us this morning, wherever you may be watching from today. I'm going to ask our deacons to come forward, and as they're coming... Of course, there are two elements that we share together in this memorial meal. One of those elements being the unleavened bread, the other being uh, the, uh, uh, in our case, an Alan Welch's grape juice. Thank you, brother, for your faith. <laughs> I might say that, that Alan and Becky Schulte have assumed the responsibility. You can go ahead and be seated for just a moment. Alan and Becky Schulte have assumed the responsibility of preparing the trays for us. Steve and Rhonda Brown have done that for several years. Steve and Rhonda are another one of those families that are gone, them and the Emmonses and Johnny and Rich and Shelba. Got a lot of folks gone this morning. But anyway, um, uh, Alan and Becky have stepped in, and I appreciate their faithfulness to that so much. But as we share together these elements, Paul reminds us that Jesus, and Paul tells us the same night he was betrayed. And I think the reason Paul shared that, of course, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, is the significance of that. Jesus could have chosen to focus on the betrayal. He chose not to. He chose to focus on the positive things that God was going to accomplish by his torment and death on the cross. And so Paul says he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And some folks would draw the conclusion from the phrase, this is my body, that, that transubstantiation takes place. Folks, it does not. Alan and Becky prepared it faithfully. We will serve it faithfully to you. But it is nothing more than a symbol, just that. But it is an important symbol because it points to a very, very important reality. I'm going to ask our deacons to stand and prepare to serve, and as they do, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. And Wayne, once again, if you would take the mic and lead us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this remembrance. Thank you that what your Son has done for us, 
we ask you as we take this bread that we understand it's the symbol, but it points to your son, our everlasting Savior. And we thank you so much for it as we present this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You want to give me the mic? God bless you as you serve, and God bless you as you receive. Jesus said simply, this is my body, broken for you. May God bless you as you share it. Okay. Guys, you can be seated for just a moment. The Apostle Paul records in 1 Corinthians 11 that after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. I'd shared earlier that we use the phrase the Lord's Supper and communion as synonyms of each other. You may also know that the word testament and the word covenant are synonyms. They mean exactly the same thing. And so we could just as well say that Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As we share in this symbol of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we are reminded that a covenant of law 
was replaced by a covenant of grace. It was not, as Paul explained, an old covenant that was flawed, but an old covenant that we could not keep. And so it wasn't replaced by the new covenant. It was fulfilled by the new covenant, a covenant of God's grace upon us and providing us the righteousness that we could not provide for ourselves through the faithful uh, life of his son, Jesus Christ. And so as we partake of this element, we are reminded that it is a new testament, a new covenant of grace. One other thing I always like to share with folks is that Paul says after the same manner he took the cup. I think I told you I had to study Greek in seminary. There's a very distinct difference in the Greek language between a something and the something. Paul says the cup because I believe that Jesus took what was referred to as Elijah's cup or the prophet's cup from the table that night. I also believe that at the point in the meal where Jesus did that was at the third cup. There were four in a Hebrew cedar uh, or setter meal, excuse me, in the Hebrew Passover meal. And we might refer them today not as cups but as toasts because there would be four times in the course of that meal where they would all raise their glass and would drink together. The third cup or the third toast was called the cup of redemption. And I believe that it was at that point in the meal that Jesus took not his cup, but the cup, Paul says, and held it up because that cup symbolized that Elijah would come and announce that the Messiah had come. Jesus took that cup. He declared to his disciples, the Messiah has come. By the way, that also explains why when Jesus went to Gethsemane, his prayer, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. He had picked up that cup that they had never drank from. He drank from it, and he gave it to each of them, and they did as well. That's why in our Baptist heritage and in some other faiths as well, uh, David, perhaps in the Catholic faith still today, there is a common cup that is shared. Because I believe at that point in that meal that night, they shared a common cup that none of them had ever drank from before. But it was the cup of a new covenant. May this cup be for you as well, a cup of the new covenant of grace that we share in Jesus Christ. Alan, I appreciate so much you helping us by uh, you and Becky providing the elements for us. Please lead us as we pray. And then I'll ask you as deacons to serve. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in remembrance of what your son did for us. Lord, be with us, guide us, lead us, and direct us as we go through this second phase of the uh, Lord's Supper. And Lord, help us to remember. In his name I pray, amen. 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 In remembrance of me, eat this bread. God bless you all. In sure. remembrance of me, drink this wine. In remembrance of me, pray for the time when God's own. of me heal the sick in remembrance of me feed the poor in remembrance of me open the door and let your brother
can remember to that this is my body and precious blood shed for you shed for you in remembrance of me search for truth in remembrance of me always love in remembrance of me don't look above but in your heart look in your heart for God do this in remembrance of me This is the new covenant in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Deacons, you may return to your families. Thank you so much for your help. As we conclude this service this morning, there are a couple of other things that I want to share with you in terms of our relationship. And one of those is our relationship with each other. I mentioned last Sunday that one of the things I dearly miss about worship is a choir. I have a, a CD that a friend gave me that I'm going to come and, or, or bring, I'm sorry, and, uh, and let you hear in a worship service. It's a massed choir of Baptist music directors called the Centurion. <clears throat> Just beautiful to hear a mass of talented voices raising praise to God. Um, it is a thrill. The other thing I miss is koinonia. We talk about fellowship as Baptists, and uh, we try to get together. In fact, every once in a while somebody asks me, well, you're Baptist, that means you guys meet and eat. I tell them we were just practicing for the marriage supper of the Lamb because we're all invited. And, uh, you know, the... But koinonia is much more than just fellowship. Koinonia is interacting with each other in a way that genuinely cares for each other. Um, koinonia does not happen, hi, how are you? And unfortunately, it's hard for koinonia to happen online. Um, to really have an opportunity to be together, to share with each other, to care for each other, to interact with our lives and what's going on, even to offer to pray for each other. That's all an experience of koinonia, and I miss that. And those of you of our church family who have not been able to come, we miss having you here. Harv and Joe, it's so good to see you back with us. And, and uh, slowly but surely, others have, have begun to come back, and I'm grateful that you are. Um, I'm going to wear a mask this morning. Depending on what your political persuasion is, some people say it doesn't do any good, and some people say you've got to wear it. I do it just out of respect. It might do some good. And it just lets you know that I care for you. And this mask was made by Pauline uh, Manis, and, or Manis and, and I just appreciate her thoughtfulness. So I'm going to wear mine. And as mis many of you are wearing yours, that's appropriate. We can still have koinonia. May God bless you for being here and being part of us today. We are given the great commandment, which is Jesus said a new commandment. I give you that you love one another, even as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's koinonia. May you experience koinonia in your life, in your home, in your family, in your church. And the other is the Great Commission. And we as, as Baptists are related to each other. 
Uh, and in fact, in some rural settings, you'll even see a missionary Baptist church. That's just a Southern Baptist church by a different name. Um, and, and many, many years ago, we were all called missionary Baptist church because it is missions that bonds us together and it expresses our relationship with the world that God has put us in. We have a responsibility both in evangelism and in ministry to carry out missions around the world. Your giving to our church enables us to send money on to our state convention and then from there to the Southern Baptist Convention and those funds are equally distributed among all of the entities that are doing missionary work literally around the world. And, uh, and we have a, uh, a way of participating in that called the Cooperative Program. By the way, October is Cooperative Program Month, just to let you know. And, uh, and so it's appropriate for me to call attention to that relationship as well. Jesus acknowledged that relationship to his disciples as Matthew records the last two verses of his gospel. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Our Hispanic friends have a beautiful expression. It's called vaya con Dios. It translates literally, go with God. May each of you vaya con Dios in your lives this day. God bless you for being here. God bless you for watching in. We're going to, in a moment, just sing a verse of an invitation hymn. Perhaps there's something God would say to your heart this morning, perhaps here, perhaps someone watching, something you just need to say, yes, Lord, yes, I hear you, and I trust you. As we stand together, as, as Ernie leads us, I believe the hymn this morning is, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. How appropriate our having observed communion together. Let us stand and sing, and then we'll be dismissed. Oh, so are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the you for being here this morning. I'm particularly grateful, Ernie, to you for stepping in for Johnny. Very well done this morning and always to our musicians. Some of our folks slipped out because they did double duty this morning. We're in both of our services. We're grateful for their faithful service. Thank you for being here. May God bless you as you go your way. May this be an especially good day for you. Wanda, you bless my heart. Glad to see you, dear friend. Ernie, you did such a good job as we began. Would you lead us in prayer as we close, please? Father, we do thank you for this opportunity we've had to worship you this morning. And as we do depart from here, let us, let us not forget that we don't leave you in this building, that you're already out there waiting for us. You're everywhere we go. Help us to remember that. Thank you again for everything you do for us. And in Jesus' name, amen.
guys made it. Why are you, were you, do you have doubts? <sighs> I'm not used to doing this. You're not used to the intros and stuff because Johnny always does those. I follow him. And I knew that this time around. That's why I'm I glad you sing the song. That's, that's that helped a lot. To make, I was trying to make your, 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 your kind of service less. <laughs> <laughs> Did you doubt? <laughs> In the first service, before, it had, before we start the service, the gremlins were out. <laughs> <laughs> 